Aloha and welcome to the Hawaii State Senate Committee on Health. Uh, this is our Wednesday, February 9th, 2022, 1 p.m. joint agenda between the Senate Health Committee and our colleagues from the Committee on Higher Education. Uh, this meeting is being streamed live, streamed live on YouTube. And in the event that we have to abruptly end this hearing due to technical difficulties, the committees will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business on Friday, February 11th at 1.10 p.m. and a public notice will be posted on the legislature's website. Uh, we have four bills on the agenda today. Uh, the committee members have received all of the written testimony. Uh, and so for the me uh, members of the public who are joining us to testify, uh, we kindly ask that you abide by our two minute testimony rule. Like I said, we have seen and read your uh, written remarks. So the first measure on the agenda is SB 2597 relating to loan repayment for healthcare professionals. Uh, first up we have in support the Department of Health. Good afternoon, Chair. This is Lauren Kim, Department of Health. We will stand on our testimony in support for our partners at JAPSA. Thank you. Thank you very much. University of Hawaii in support. Good afternoon, Kelly Withy, uh, University of Hawaii and uh, recipient of the federal grant for the matching funding. I just want to say uh, since 2012, we've really appreciated support. We've had 64 loan repairs. 36 of them are either paid off or finished their commitment. And of those, 58% um, are still at the sites where they did their practice. And uh, over 70 are still in Hawaii in areas of need. So we thank you and stand in support. Thank you very much. Healthcare Association of Hawaii in support. Thank you, Chair. We'll stand on our testimony in support and appreciate the past uh, support of this program. And thanks to uh, partners like Dr. Withy in helping to support uh, bringing in healthcare professionals to our rural settings. Thanks. Thank you very much. Kaiser Permanente in support. Hi, Chair, Vice Chair Jonathan Ching for Kaiser Permanente. We will also stand on our written testimony and support um, echoing um, the comments of the previous testifier of the great uh, partnership with, um, with Dr. Withy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Queens Health Systems in support. Aloha, Chair and Vice Chair. Uh, we'll stand in very strong support as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, those are all the individuals who registered to testify on this measure. Is there anyone else uh, on the call who I missed? Okay, seeing none, I'd like to note the written comments of the Department of Budget and Finance and the sporting testimony of the following individuals and organizations, the Department of Labor and Industrial Re Relations, the East Hawaii Region of uh, HHSC, the Hawaii Medical Association, Hawaii Pacific Health, the Hawaii Primary Care Association, the Hawaii Psychiatric Medical Association, the Hawaii State Rural Health Association, Lynn Murakami Akatsuka, Colleen Inouye, and Paige Sumida. Members, are there any questions on this measure? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to the next measure on the agenda, SB 2655, relating to Medical Education Special Fund. This reestablishes the Hawaii Medical Education Special Fund. Uh, first up, University of Hawaii in support. Please unmute yourself. Aloha, Senators. Thank you so much. I'm Lee Wenkensei Holum, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the University of Hawaii, and wanted to uh, just stand on our testimony in support of Senate Bill 2655. Thank you very much, Doctor. It looks like that's all the, the that's all the individual testimony we have registered. Is there anyone else on the call that we missed? Okay, we have written testimony from the Department of Budget and Finance offering comments, and again, supporting testimony uh, from Hawaii Pacific Health, the Hawaii Primary Care Association, the Hawaii Psychiatric Medical Association, Lynn Murakami Akatsuka, and the Hawaii State Rural Health Association. Members, any questions? Okay, we'll move to the next measure, SB 2656, relating to medical education and training. This appropriates funds to support additional opportunities for medical residencies and training programs in a partnership between the John A. Burns School of Medicine and the Veterans Administration. University of Hawaii. Aloha again, thank you. The University of Hawaii stands in strong support of Senate Bill 2656, thank you. Thank you very much. Next we have the Healthcare Association of Hawaii in support. We'll stand on our support, thank you, Chair. 
Thank you very much. Queens Health Systems. Aloha, Chair, Vice Chair. We will also stand on our testimony in strong support of this and the fall and the next bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's all the registered testimony. Is there anyone else? Okay. Uh, we also have written testimony of BNF with comments and then the following uh, organizations in support. HPH, the Hawaii Parkinson's Association, Hawaii Primary Care Association, Hawaii Psychiatric Medical Association, Hawaii State Rural Health Association, Lynn Murakami Akatsuka, and Amy Harvey. Members, questions? Okay, we'll move to the last measure on the agenda, SB 2657, relating to medical education and training. This appropriates funds to create more residencies and training opportunities on the neighbor islands for medical students at the University of Hawaii John A. Burns School of Medicine. First up, University of Hawaii. Aloha, thank you. Uh, we stand in support of Senate Bill 2656, and this is for to support both residency and medical student, uh, primarily residency education. So thank you. Thank you very much. Kaiser Permanente in support. Hi, Chair. Um, again, we'll stand in support. I just want to echo one point um, and highlight one point in our in our testimony. And we, we just really are in support of this because um, we believe expanding residency opportunities on the neighbor islands will not only um, you know acquaint uh, resident physicians, right? So recent graduates um, with uh, training or medicine in rural settings. Um, we think it's going to be really beneficial because it's also going to enlarge um, having the faculty practice on the neighbor islands. And we know you know that's where where the critical need is for all healthcare providers. Um, so having this opportunity and supporting this is just really important. We just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Healthcare Association of Hawaii in support. Um, thank you, Chair. We'll stand in our strong support again on, on this measure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Queens Health Systems. Same for us, uh, strong support and uh, especially for our neighbor island uh, communities. Thank you. Thank you. We also have written testimony from BNF with comments, uh, East Hawaii region of HHSC in support, HMA, HPH, HPCA, HPMA, Colleen Inouye and Lynn Murakami Akatsuka, all in support. Members, any questions? Okay, I'm ready to uh, Chair. put on this, but I don't think we have quorum, do we? Mr. Chair, I have a, can I ask a late question? Oh, please. On um, SB 2655 from the um, UH. Are they still here? Somebody yes. From the University? Yes, I am. Um, yeah, if I may, um, I noticed that the testimony from Budget and Finance is questioning whether or not the special fund would be self-sustaining. Can you comment on that? Okay, thank you. The special fund would be uh, able to, if if the legislature passes um, this these measures and you know allocates uh, funds to that or if there's any other sources of funding, uh, philanthropy, other foundations, other grants, uh, then, then those monies could be placed into the, into the special fund and then would be used again for the purposes of um, increasing uh, our ability to rotate residents on the neighbor islands. I guess that's the concern that is raised by BNF because all special funds um, is supposed to be able to demonstrate the capacity to be, to, I'm sorry, I'm hearing somebody else, um, to have the capacity to be financially self-sustaining. And I know that the funds you mentioned is not one that is consistent or is guaranteed. So without those, is there a me um, method in which this fund would be self-sustaining? Uh, that's a good question. Not that I can think of at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, any other questions on 20, SB 2655 or any of the other measures on the agenda? Okay, seeing none, uh, Chair Kim, we're prepared to vote on the health committee. Do you have quorum? I'm sorry. Okay, we're waiting for our quorum, but go ahead and vote. And um, oh, there he is. 
we have uh, Senator Keith Agaran. So we, we are ready to vote as well. Okay, great. So um, members will go into decision-making. The first measure, SB 2597, this is relating to loan repayment for healthcare professionals. I'm going to recommend that we blank out the appropriation amounts uh, in the bill and defect the effective date to January 1, 2050. Any comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, Vice Chair SB 2597, passing with amendments. Chair votes aye. Uh, you're muted, Vice Chair. There. Okay, go ahead. Okay. All right, we'll try, we'll try again. So uh, Senator Keoho Kaloli, Chair voted aye. Vice Chair votes aye. Senator Moriwaki. Aye. Senator uh, Joy Sanabin for <laughs> Sorry, Joy Hi. and Buenaventura. Aye. Thank you. Senator Favela. Aye. Chair, your recommendations adopted. Five eyes. Thank and you. for the Committee on Higher Education, the same recommendation to uh, pass with amendments, Senate Bill 2597, and with uh, four members present, with Senator Wakai taking the um, a, a vote. If you would please, the chair votes aye. Uh, Senator Kidani is excused. Senator Agaron? Keith Agaron? Aye. Aye. I vote yes. Senator Fabella? Yes. Okay, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next measure, the next two measures, SB 2655 and 2656, I'd like to incorporate into the final measure. Uh, so we'll be deferring those two bills, SB 2655 and 2656. So the recommendation for the final measure on the agenda, SB 2657, is to incorporate the reestablishment of the medical education special fund from the prior bill, also incorporate the residency program in partnership with the VA from SB 2656, make conforming amendments to the preamble, blank the appropriation amount, effect the effective date to January 1, 2050, there are also some technical non-substantive amendments. Members, any comments or questions? Um, so, sorry, Chair, just a real fast question. And then the 6,700,000 that you put in SB 2657, that sum now goes into the special fund? The, the, we will reestablish the special fund, but the appropriation amounts are gonna be blank. Okay, so the 6,700,000 is going to be blanked out. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chair? Yes. Can we put in the committee report just that the, as it moves forward, that the um, whether or not the, the special fund would be self sustaining would be considered as it moves forward? Yes. Okay, thank you. Members, any other comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, Vice Chair, SB 2657, passing with amendments. Chair votes aye. Chair votes aye. Vice Chair votes aye. Senator Moriwaki. Aye. Senator San Buenaventura. Aye. Senator Favela. Aye. Chair, your recommendations adopted five ayes. And for the Committee on Higher Education, Senate Bill 2657 to Amend. Uh, um, uh, any discussion, members? If not, Chair votes aye. Senator Kidani, excuse Senator Keith Agaran. Aye. I vote yes, Senator Favela. Aye. Okay. Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, health members, we are on for a 1.15 agenda in one minute. Otherwise, uh, this 1 p.m. agenda is adjourned. Thank you very much. for control, prevention, and abatement of noise pollution emitted by vehicles in the state. It prohibits the use, ownership, and sale 
It, it also prohibits the use, ownership, and sale of excessively loud vehicles. Uh, first up, for the Department of Health offering comments. Uh, I guess they're not present, Chair. Okay, that's the only registered testifier we have on this measure, SB 2127. Is there anyone else on the call who would like to testify on this bill? Okay, I'd like to note for the record, uh, 25 individuals, including five organizations, uh, submitted testimony in support, two in opposition, and one offering comments. Uh, seeing as how we do not have any testifiers to ask questions of. Uh, why don't we recess and uh, uh, prepare for the decision making? Recess. Okay, we will reconvene this uh, Wednesday, February 9th, 1.15 p.m. joint committee hearing between the Senate Health Committee and the Senate Committee on Transportation to consider SB 2127 uh, relating to noise pollution. Uh, so the recommendation for this measure is to uh, convert the measure into- Hawaii too. The, the recommendation for this measure is to uh, convert the measure into a task force uh, to examine the extent that noise pollution laws are being violated, whether existing laws and regulations controlling noise pollution are sufficient, whether existing laws and regulations are being properly enforced, whether there are laws or regulations that are preventing enforcement, and any other issue the task force considers relevant. Uh, we will also uh, recommend that the task force propose any legislation it deems necessary in its report uh, 20 days before the convening of the legislative session next year. Uh, we'll also include the Department of Health uh, as the lead. We'll include representatives from each of the county governments, uh, representatives from uh, state and county law enforcement, House and Senate designees, and, um, and we also have some technical non-substantive amendments. Members, any comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, Vice Chair SB 2127. Sorry, sorry, Chair, just, just one clarification. I know we're seeing vehicles, yeah? Vehicles, and um, I don't know if we got to put it in the notes that um, a lot of these problems we're having is uh, mopeds, yeah? A lot of the mopeds in the late at night, early in the morning. I know we consider them as vehicle, but if we don't specify, not everybody understand what is vehicle. Vehicle, they're gonna think it's just cars or buses or trucks. So, so uh, that in. Okay, so noted Senator. What I'd like to do is include in the committee report um, clarification that um, uh, the impetus for the task force are uh, noise pollution coming, it is noise pollution coming from stationary and non-stationary sources because that appears to be the gray area in which enforcement is a challenge. So we want to catch all of it and, and have them report back to us on how we need to fix it. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, noting that Vice Chair voting on SB 2127, passing with amendments, Chair votes aye. Vice Chair, you're on mute. <laughs> I don't control that, but <laughs> the other guys are controlling it. Uh, on Senate Bill 2127, recommendation of the chair is to pass with amendments. Chair uh, voted aye, vice chair votes aye. Senator Moriwaki? Aye. Senator San Buenaventura? Aye. Senator Favela? Aye. Chair, your uh, recommendation is adopted, five ayes. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Committee of Transportation, same recommendation. Um, I'll take the vote for us. I'll vote aye. Uh, sorry, passing SB 2127 with amendments. I'll vote aye. Vice Chair excused. Senator DeCoit? Aye. Senator Shimabukuro? 
Aye. And Senator Favela. Aye. Thank you. Measures adopted. Thank you very much. I'm going to adjourn the 1.15 p.m. agenda. Okay, calling into order the Committee on Public Safety, Intergovernmental and Military Affairs and the Committee on Health for the Wednesday, February 9th, 2022, 1.30 agenda. And I'd like to begin by first um, uh, introducing, we have Senator Lynn DeCoit and Senator Roz Baker. And I see we have, although not from my committee, uh, Joyce and Buenaventura, and certainly the chair for health, uh, Jared Caleb uh, Kalole. I think that's it. Uh, I don't see, uh, is Senator Favela there? Okay, I guess I'll let, uh, uh, when it comes time for uh, Chair of uh, Health to introduce his members. I'm here, Chair. Okay, thank you, Senator Fabella. Uh, so Chair, uh, would you want to introduce your members for the health? Uh, the only other member uh, you missed was Senator Sharon Moriwaki, who's also on the video. Oh, okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Got to do the usual. Um, this meeting is being streamed live on YouTube. In the unlikely event, we have to abruptly end this hearing due to technical difficulties. The committee will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business on February 10th, 2022 at 1 p.m. Zoom. For testifiers and participating remotely, your audio will be muted and the video disabled until shortly before it's your turn to testify. Um, you'll be given two minutes uh, for, for testifier. I'll be reading a list of the individuals who submitted written testimony for each measure. We apologize at the close Captioning doesn't accurately transcribe the names. If you're interested in viewing the um, written testimony, please go to the legislature's website. You'll find a link on the status page. So on uh, that note, I guess we're ready to start with the first item on the agenda, Senate Bill 2017 related to emergency medical services. Repeal section 453-34 DEHRS, which limits licensure to an emergency medical technician one, to individuals whose practice is performed in a county with a population of 500,000 or greater. So for the first testifier on that measure, we have uh, just a second. Looking for that list. Just a second. You have the list of testifiers in your binder. I okay. I just see it. Okay, got the binder on my side. My apologies. Okay, for that first measure, we have uh, testifying. We have. Gary Lum for Hawaii State Fire Council. Gary, are you there? Yes, good afternoon, Chair Nishihara and yeah. Chair Keoho Kalalele and members of the committees. Gary Lum testifying on behalf of the State Fire Council. We stand on our written testimony submitted in support of this bill. Thank you. Next, we also have um, Alani Kuyog the uh, testing for the Hawaii Medical Board. 
Uh, good afternoon, chairs, vice chairs, members of the committee, Alani Kiyoki with the Hawaii Medical Board. Um, the, the board will review this measure at its meeting tomorrow and can be, get back to the committees with its position. Thank you. Thank you. And we have other testif uh, testifiers, but they're sending written testimony and not on the, on the video. It's uh, Sheldon Howe for Honolulu Fire Department in support, uh, Bradford Ventura for the Maui Fire Department in support, and Lea Leanne uh, Kapahu Fire Chief for Hawaii Fire Department also in support. And I think those are all the testifiers for this particular measure. Good. Any uh, members, any question on this? I just want to go I you missed that person, yeah. No, I did. No, no, I didn't. I called her. Yeah, right there. You have to no, I have her. She spoke. Sorry. <laughs> A discussion with my staff and this sort of the list. Um, Bridget, are you on that list of testifiers? I don't see your name, that's why. No, okay. Anyway, members, any questions about this bill? If not, I guess we'll move on to the next one. Senate Bill 2026. Uh, relating to emergency medical services, personnel licensure, interstate compact, enters Hawaii into the emergency medical services, personnel licensure, interstate compact to allow EMS personnel from other states to practice in Hawaii during a declared emergency. Okay, we have uh, Esther Brown for Regulated Industry Complaints Office. Esther. Uh -huh. Hi, good afternoon, chairs, vice chairs, and members of the committees. My name is Esther Brown, and I am the uh, Complaints and Enforcement Officer for the Regulated Industries Complaints Office. You do have our written testimony in front of you offering comments on the measure. And if I could just summarize them briefly, um, RICO does have several concerns related to the measure. Uh, first, there isn't a notification provision to the Hawaii Medical Board for people that will be practicing under the compact if it becomes law. There isn't a fee provision as well to help um, both the board and RICO um, uh, defray the costs of enforcement and regulation. Uh, there is a provision in the law that, uh, that creates an affirmative duty on the part of members to provide investigatory records um, to the organization. And we don't have a problem providing public records, but when it comes to medical information, treatment records, and so forth, there's a lot of protection afforded those records. And currently our practice is not to disclose them. So unfortunately, this compact actually requires members uh, to disclose those records. And uh, finally, there appears to be a provision uh, in the measure that allows the governing body the authority to reach back to member states and pull on bodies, so personnel, as well as financial um, resources to help them, it looks like, um, meet their administrative and operational costs. And so our concern is that it really doesn't comport with the uh, very narrow mandate uh, that RICO is charged with. And so for those reasons, we do have concerns. Um, my final commentary is that I know that the Hawaii Medical Board has not yet had an opportunity to fully vet the measure. And so as the enforcement arm for the Hawaii Medical Board, we certainly will be deferring to them on the position they ultimately come up with on this measure. So with that, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. And I will be here in case any members have any questions. Aloha. Okay, thank you, Esther. Um, Alani Kueo. You are, are you're muted, Alani. Mm. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, thank go you. Ahead. I apologize. Uh, good afternoon again, Alani Kiyoki, the Executive Officer of the Hawaii Medical Board. Um, as Esther had indicated, the board has not had an opportunity to review this measure, but will do so at its publicly noticed meeting tomorrow at 1 p.m. And we'll be happy to get back to the committees with its position. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we have uh, Jeff Zuckernick. I, I don't believe my video can start, but um, I stand by the testimony presented. Okay, thank you. Um, 
We also have um, a late uh, submittal, Evan Q, but he uh, sent in opposition to it. And I think that brings us to the end of the uh, testifiers. Oh, yeah, Joe Kent, but he's not on the list of testifiers no, for visual, but he sent in comments. He's for the Grassroots Institute of Hawaii. So, members, any questions to any of the Sorry, testifiers? Evan is, I think Evan yes. is here yes, available. Senator. Go ahead, Senator. Uh, I think your testifier, Evan, is here on video and uh, maybe you would like oh, to. You want to okay, we can, we can hear him. Uh, Aloha, Chair Nishihara, uh, Chair Keno Kolole. Apologies for our late testimony. Um, me uh, Aloha, members of the committee as well. My name is Evan Oye. I'm testifying on behalf of uh, Hawaii Association for Justice, or HAJ. Uh, we appreciate the intent of this measure. However, we are concerned with some of its language as it provides the Interstate Commission for EMS members and representatives qualified immunity for civil liability. Uh, our primary concern with the bill is that it is a little confusing and grants overbody immunity to members, employees, or representatives of the commission for negligent acts under Article 10 F1. Uh, the exemptions to the immunity only apply for intentional or wanton misconduct while omitting, omitting negligent acts that could harm our residents. For example, if a member, officer, employee, or representative of the commission is driving as a part of the member's duties or responsibilities with the commission and runs over a pedestrian, then they will be immune from civil liability. Uh, if the legislature's goal with subsection F1 is to prevent commission members from having to personally pay for their own defense or liability, then those concerns are already addressed with subsection F2 and F3, which provide that the commission will defend and indemnify any member in any civil action. Uh, we respectfully recommend that Article 10 F1 be removed. Uh, mahalo for the opportunity to testify. We'll be available for questions. Okay, thank, uh, thank you, Evan. Members, any other questions? If not, um, can we go to the break room? Okay, we're back after the break on Senate on the Wednesday, February 9th, 1.30 uh, hearing. And uh, the committees have uh, conferred. And this is the recommendation. On Senate Bill 2017 is to pass it as is. Uh, members, any questions? Uh, are we ready to the vote? Uh, this case, Chair for Public Safety goes aye. You have. To oh, I'm sorry. I've got the vote sheet. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me grab it. Get it carried away here. Uh, okay. Uh, Senator DeQuint. Aye. Okay. Senator Baker. Senator Baker, are you muted? No. Hi. Hi. Okay. Senator Revere. Hi. Hi. Senator Favela. Hi. Okay. Motions adopted and for health. Uh, members, Health Committee, same recommendation, passing unamended. Chair uh, votes. Vice, chair votes aye. Uh, Vice Chair votes aye. Senator Moriwaki. Aye. Senator San Benaventura. Aye. Senator Favela. Aye. Five ayes, Chair, your recommendations adopted. Thank you. And then the final one, uh, Senate Bill. 
2026. We're going to defer that indefinitely. This concludes this hearing. Thank you, members. Okay, thank you very much to our friends from the Public Safety uh, Intergovernmental and Military Affairs Committee. We'll now open our uh, Senate Health Committee 1.35 p.m. agenda to hear uh, a number of bills. Let me see here. Okay, members, I, I, I would like to, uh, members and members of the public who are watching, uh, I would like to vote on these measures uh, in this committee hearing. We do finish at 2.30 p.m. So if we're unable to get into a vote uh, by then, we'll need to defer decision-making to another day, which would be Friday, uh, February 11th at 1.30 p.m. Uh, if um, you're signed up to testify, we've received your written testimony. So I'd encourage you to stand on your testimony if you, uh, if you only intended to read from the screen. But if you have additional comments you'd like to make, then please feel free to utilize your two minutes. On that, we'll move to the first measure, SB 2282, relating to abortion care. This class clarifies that access to abortion care is inclusive of all pregnant people in the state, repeals a criminal penalty for violations of certain abortion provisions, and clarifies that advanced practice registered nurses may provide abortion care. First up, we have Aloha Care in support. Okay, Board of Nursing with comments. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Um, Chelsea Fukunaga standing in for Leanne Tishima, Executive Officer of the Hawaii State Board of Nursing. The board will stand on its written testimony offering comments on this measure. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have Hawaii Medical Board offering comments. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair. The Hawaii Medical Board will stand on its written comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Planned Parenthood Alliance Advocates Hawaii. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Rachel Kinsey, and I'm testifying today on behalf of Planned Parenthood Alliance Advocates Hawaii. Planned Parenthood strongly supports SB 2282, and we stand on our written testimony. With federal protections for abortion care in grave danger, Hawaii cannot afford to have statutory gaps that put access to abortion at risk. This housekeeping bill protects the right to safe, legal abortion in three ways. First, it clarifies that all pregnant people in Hawaii, including transgender and gender non-binary people, have the right to abortion care. Second, it provides statutory consistency across state abortion codes. For example, currently there are two different definitions of abortion in the physician and the nursing codes. SB 2282 would bring these two sections into alignment, providing clarity and avoiding confusion. And third, this bill repeals archaic provisions that threaten criminal punishment for abortion providers. Last year was the worst year of state attacks on abortion in nearly 50 years, with over 100 abortion restrictions enacted into law nationwide. And for over six months, Texas has blocked abortion access almost entirely for pregnant people in the state. The Supreme Court has repeatedly failed to stop Texas's deliberate nullification of the constitutional right to abortion, and now is set to decide a 15-week Mississippi abortion ban that directly challenges Roe v. Wade. The combination of the court green lighting a near total abortion ban in Texas and the impending demise of Roe means one thing, we should all be alarmed. Even here in Hawaii, where we proudly support the right to abortion, too many people do not have meaningful access to care. Abortion is not controversial in Hawaii. Po polls show that 85% of voters believe it is important for all people to have the access to reproductive health care options, including abortion. With the right to abortion care okay, at the federal level. Much. We have to move on. Thank uh, you so much. Just all the registered testifiers that we have for this measure, is there anyone else on the call who would like to testify? Okay, members, are there any questions for any of our live testifiers? Okay, I'd like to note uh, the written testimony. Uh, for the record, we had 45 individuals and organizations who testified in support, two who testified in opposition, and two with comments. Uh, seeing that we have no questions, we'll move to the next measure on the agenda. SB 2913, relating to accessibility, 
This requires a retail establishment with an employee toilet facility to allow a customer suffering from an eligible medical condition to use that restroom during normal business hours under certain conditions. It exempts a retail establishment and employees from civil liability in following an eligible customer to use an employee toilet facility. Uh, in allowing, I'm sorry, uh, and it establishes fines. Uh, we have the Department of Health offering comments. Aloha Chair, this is Lauren Kim, Department of Health. Uh, I'd like to highlight a couple of uh, issues on our uh, testimony, submitting comments. Uh, creating a new section in the generic uh, chapter 321 that um, belongs to the Department of Health uh, brings to mind issues of enforceability and how difficult it will be to actually enforce um, uh, the what was in the description, but I, I don't really see in the bill, which is, which is fines. Uh, the department urges that if the legislature moves this forward to consider 103-50, which is the Americans with it, which is the Disability Communications Access Board, uh, DCAB section, um, due to its proximity to Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, uh, that is, uh, their enforcement authority is a lot more, is, is, is more readily apparent and could be a part of permitting, for example, for a, a new facility to receive authorization from DCAB to proceed with construction, they may, DCAB may require policies and procedures in place that allow this practice um, that that uh, make the employ that make the establishment um, implement this this proposed practice. Um, thank you, and I'll be available for questions. Thank you very much. A Big Island Ostomy Group in support. And I actually have a, a, can you hear me? Oh, okay. Okay, I'm Sandy Wright and I have a colostomy and I'm the president of the Big Island Ostomy Group. Uh, there are many um, problems where we might need a bathroom right away. People with Crohn's disease, with um, IBS, with uh, um, any kind of ostomy uh, things, we might need a bathroom right away to avoid an accident where we might have a leak where it's embarrassing. A lot of us become homebound because we're scared to go out in case there is no place where we can go to the bathroom and fix any problems that can occur. Um, this is only if there is no public uh, restroom available. Also, I did want to make it clear that um, there is no, uh, they don't, no, I'm sorry, I'm nervous, but <laughs> there is, um, they're not liable for any damages. Uh, from the act and also there's no physical changes needed for any of the restrooms and there are 15 states that have already approved this law and it's something that is very important to people that do have a correct medical procedure where they would have a note from a doctor or a organization that deals with this so thank you i do support this and i hope that it does pass it's very important thank you thank you very much hawaii association for justice and opposition uh, Mahalo Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, uh, Evan Oe, again, again on behalf of Hawaii Association for Justice. Uh, we stand on a written testimony citing our concerns with the immunity from uh, civil liability language in the new subsection B, uh, which, grants, uh, which is granted to retail establishments. Uh, I will be available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We also have the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission in support. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Retail Merchants of Hawaii in opposition. Aloha and good afternoon. Um, you know, while we are concerned with, the, um, with people who have these types of diseases, we have a lot of concerns. For, for us, it's more of a safety concern, especially for employees. A lot of our bathrooms are in the back. We have a lot of um, product out there. We've also found out with this pandemic that a lot of people, it's easy to get fake cards or fake doctor's notes and we have no way of um, justifying if they're correct or not and this gives a lot of ins to the um, organized retail crimes to come into our, off, our our place of business and steal from us even more i've had one guy who even told me that they lost um, about a million dollars worth of product so you know a lot of businesses can't afford it and you know shopping centers already have public bathrooms um, within the center itself and also another thing that we haven't put in our testimony is we're scared of also age discrimination because if they see somebody going to the bathroom, you know, who's kind of young and we let them in and then grandma comes and has to go to the bathroom, well, how come we can't let her go? And then we're going to face lawsuits, whether there's 
um, laws in place or not. And it's just going to add on more to the cost of living here in Hawaii because we're going to pass that down to the customers. Um, so again, we also wonder if we have to offer restrooms then also to those that are um, not our customers, like, you know, the residents you challenged who has letters and other people as well. Um, while we do sympathize with those suffering from any type of disease, we see this measure as a safety issue, not only for our stores, but our employees as well. So we hope that you hold this measure. Mahalo. Thank you very much. That's all the registered testimony we have for this bill. Is there anyone on the call I missed? Okay, seeing none, I'd like to note the written testimony uh, in support of this measure from Robin Wurzel, Deborah Nemad, and Carl Verity. Members, are there any questions? Okay, uh, do I have a question for you? Okay, Department of Health, I have a question. Yes, Chair. You know, my read of chapter 321, well, my read of the, um, shoot, I don't have the notes. The, the My read of your testimony uh, is that you're recommending that this go into the section around building requirements. And so yeah. I'm not sure how that ultimately uh, imposes any sort of duty on on a retail, because it, it seems to me like the, the intent of this bill is for the business to be required to accommodate. And so whether they have a bathroom or not, and whether the bathroom is accessible or not, is not really the question that this bill is trying to answer. So uh, I acknowledge that concern and it was quite difficult to think about a, a more appropriate place in Hawaii revised statute. I That was the closest that I could get to um, a, a section or a chapter that at least deals with the Americans with Disability Act, which I think is a an, and uh, a intellectual and legal framework to have this discussion. Uh, it, it may be, uh, again, if we're talking about retail merchants, um, there are other laws on the books that govern uh, uh, commerce, but in terms of um, public health, uh, creating a new section in 321, I, I, it's just very difficult for me to see how we would enforce this. Um, you know, how evidence would be documented. If, is there a complaint mechanism? Uh, the lack of our, the, 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 the bill as drafted is silent on fines. Um, so I think that um, we can discuss and think through this uh, further. There are other considerations, maybe other areas of statute that we can think of, but uh, the Americans with Disability Act was the closest that I could get um, in the time that I had. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's the question of enforcement that is really bedeviling me. Um, and uh, 103-50 may be inappropriate. Um, and so the legislature may, legislature may have to uh, consider building out a whole new part or chapter um, that is self-contained with the appropriate authorities. Um, to enforce this. Um, I, I, I don't see a practical way of enforcing this by creating a new section in 321. Okay, thank you. Members, any other questions on this? Senator Morimaki. Sorry. There you go. Oh, uh, so Lauren, just to follow up to that, if there was no enforcement requirement, because it seems like we're just trying to help these people out. If you gotta go, you gotta go. And, and rather than have an accident in your establishment, it, it, would, that, would that be helpful so that there is no enforcement, but at least it's a kind of a good neighborly law, I guess, is, you know, um, if you have to go and, and somebody's there in your, as a customer, um, you know, and, and that you let them use your bathroom. Um, is there any way if you just didn't have any enforcement, but, you know, require it as a standard of, of sorts? So, yeah, so I think uh, if there were no enforcement provisions like a fine or a way for us to enforce it, I think it, it, it sends a message to the community that this is what our... Um, what our state's attitude should be for people who are in a desperate situation due to a medical condition over which they have no control. So certainly from that compassionate and empathetic point of view, uh, there is definite value. Um, and one can only hope that, you know, retail merchants who can't afford this or who have adequate safety um, 
uh, protocols in place. And we, uh, we know that they're just very different businesses with access to different resources, that they would lead the way and this would become a trend in our community. But um, as written, it, um, it's not enforceable um, and it's not really a public health issue, um, but it is certainly an issue of aloha and compassion. And I think further discussion on where uh, where we can put that and how that's worded is is warranted. It's because if it established the way it looks, is an establishment doesn't have the facility and cannot accommodate, they they don't. I mean, it's not like you have to do it. So if you can look at where it could be placed. Correct. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Chair. <clears throat> yeah. So some of the establishments that don't have. Um, Department of Health, um, if this um, bill pass, um, shouldn't that be required that so at least let the customers know? Because I know in, in some of the shopping centers in my district, they had public restrooms, but they did shut it down during the, uh, the COVID problems, but they never post signs. All they did was put a padlock on it. And um, that caused a lot of uh, discomfort from the community they have to use McDonald's. But, um, you know, going forward, um, I really, I listened to the testifiers. I can relate when I had my mom um, on the wheelchair and we went to an establishment and then they just decided that they wasn't going to let nobody use it anymore. And um, it was a very big inconvenience. So I think if we do pass this bill and we cannot enforce laws, that at least they have signs posted if there is a facility for them to use and not use the word employees only because this is the reason why we're coming up with this bill. Understood. Um, and so here we are with the question of, is this a, uh, is this a customer service um, conversation, uh, a retail management conversation or a public health conversation? So um, there are a lot of different ways that we can spin this. And um, I would just encourage uh, further deliberation to see how we can maybe meet in the middle to address retail merchants' concerns, to address these patients' concerns. Um, as, as drafted, it just seems a, uh, an aspirational law uh, rather than a problem-solving one. And if that's what we're, our community is willing to live with, and as Senator Moriwaki said, we can hope it sends a message to our community that this is what we hope people will offer our fellow residents. Um, so. We'll, I'll leave that with the committee to deliberate. Thank you. So just to note, there is a fine established on page four in subsection B. Uh, the, but you know the the concern about whether that fine would be enforceable or not, and who would do it. Uh, th those concerns from the Department of Health, I think, are noted. Uh, members, any other questions? Okay. If not, then we'll move to the next measure. Uh, SB 2954 relating to feminine hygiene products. Uh, this provides an exemption from the GET beginning July 1st, 2022 for the sale of feminine hygiene products in the state. Uh, first up, the Department of Trust, uh, Taxation offering comments. Thank you, Chair Keohoko Lole and Vice Chair uh, Baker, as well as the members of the committee. Uh, Teresa Zetwick on behalf of the Department of Taxation, and we stand on our written testimony offering comments and are available for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Hawaii Food Industry Association in support. Not present, Chair. Thank you. Retail Merchants of Hawaii in support. Yes, we are very much in support of this measure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tax Foundation of Hawaii with comments. Uh, thank you, Chair Members. Tom Yamachika from Tax Foundation. Uh, we've submitted written comments. We'll stand on those and uh, be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me see. We also have, uh, well, so are there any other individuals who would like to testify on this measure on the call? Okay. We also have the following uh, written testimonies. Uh, comments from the Department of Budget and Finance, Common Cause Hawaii, and supporting testimony from the Hawaii Public Health Institute, Ma'i Movement Hawaii, Save Medicaid Hawaii, State Council on Developmental Disabilities, Sid Holtful, Deborah Namod, Ryan Ozawa, Patricia Billick, and Tammy Whitney. Uh, members, any questions? Okay, we'll move on. SB 3160, relating to psilocybin, this establishes the therapeutic psilocybin working group to examine the medicinal and therapeutic effects of psilocybin 
and develop a long-term strategic plan to ensure the availability of therapeutic psilocybin or psilocybin-based products that are safe, accessible, and affordable for adults 21 years of age or older. Uh, Department of Health with comments. Uh, Aloha Chair, members of the committee, Lauren Kim again. Um, the department will stand on its uh, testimony, expressing some concerns about emerging uh, federal guidance and whether uh, community discussions are premature until and unless that federal guidance, which has been fast-tracked by the FDA, has been published, uh, as well as scope of practice issues, which are not in the wheelhouse of the Department of Health. Uh, thank you, and I'll be available for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, from Beyond Mental Health, uh, in support. You're muted. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Dr. Thomas Cook, psychiatrist in private practice in Honolulu. I just wanna address a couple uh, kind of background uh, philosophical questions that pertain to psychedelics and how people think about them. Um, altered experiences, altered mental states are part of life. And we've all, we've all known uh, a child or remember being a child making themselves dizzy on a swing set and many of us have fallen in love at some point, and that's one of the biggest decisions we'll ever make in our life when we um, can be, you know, admittedly somewhat irrational. Um, clinical research uh, shows that altered mental states can heal depression. And um, many would discount the idea that one single experience could heal depression, but we know from trauma that if I'm kidnapped for three hours, tortured, then released, to safety, uh, you know, that single three hours may affect me, my brain chemistry for months afterwards. And so likewise, a, an altered mental state like we do in our clinic with ketamine or like what's being done with uh, psilocybin studies, you, you often see months and months of uh, improvements. Um, on the other hand, the idea of a chemical imbalance in the brain what we've been living under this false science, unscientific false idea for 30 years, promoted by drug companies. And this idea of taking a medicine every day, it, it fosters an attitude of fatalism and incurability. And we have higher and higher rates of antidepressants now. 17% of the population uh, is now on them and it's gone up with COVID. And I don't think we can wait. We can't wait any longer. We need to press on ahead and uh, go where psychiatry is already going. Many doctors and uh, many clinicians are already moving in this direction. And I think um, we need to be one of the states okay. that's Thank not- Thank you very not much. Uh, we have to move on. Next, we have HPMA in opposition. Hi, good afternoon, Chair Kehokalele, Vice Chair Baker and members of the committee. My name is Marva Lawson. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Hawaii Psychiatric Medical Association. I stand on the testimony submitted in opposition with the following emphasis. While the FDA has granted psilocybin breakthrough therapy status, it is focused only on the treatment resistant major depressive disorder. The FDA has not yet approved psilocybin for treatment of any medical <clears throat> excuse me, condition. Breakthrough therapy status approval does not establish the safety and efficacy of psilocybin use. Rather, it merely establishes the process to further study and gather scientific evidence for psilocybin use. Thus, we respectfully request that you defer this bill. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm available for questions. Thank you very much. Next, we have the Oahu Economic Development Board in support. Okay, Alan Johnson in opposition. Yes, uh, aloha chair and uh, committee members. Uh, Alan Johnson, Hawaii Subs Abuse Coalition representing treatment, prevention and harm reduction practices. Say uh, psilocybin, tremendous potential, very dangerous drug. So there's been about five years of cl valid clinical studies, not those small kind of studies, valid clinical trial, numbers of states, large universities, thousands of people have come through. The conclusions came in October last year, two things that brought up. One is very dangerous drug. People died during the, the uh, valid clinical trials. That's outrageous. They were taking meth and apparently it doesn't work well with meth, doesn't work too well with barbiturates, doesn't work with other things. But they put together some of the formulas and ideas 
because the second study, the second result was 29% of the people received huge reductions in their depressive symptoms. Now, okay, magic mushrooms, not the magic pill, but for 29% of the people, it is the magic pill. It just did tremendous good for them. And so the FDA has, has determined a breakthrough therapy and they've now given it to labs to figure out a safe formula. Now in the last three, four months, the labs have said they got these formulas, but they haven't figured out how to have a safety widespread application of that across the nation. And because the FDA gave them a breakthrough therapy, no red tape, they expect within the year to maybe early next year, we're gonna have this available across the nation. And so they understand that you know some states are pushing the envelope, but the United States Medical Society has said, it's too soon, it's not safe yet, it's still a controlled drug, it soon will be available. And once we have national protocols, then I think we could meet to see what's good for Hawaii. So it's coming, we're just a little premature. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Alan. Uh, next we have May Fui Maono Poi in support. Not present, Chair. Raymond Kemp, Chloe Groom, Andre Biscara. If I see a video come on, then I'll, I'll stop. Amanda Lillibridge. Hello, hi. My name is Chloe. I am an herbalist. I work with Chinese medicine for the last 11 years, as well as other modalities. I wanna say that psilocybin containing mushrooms contain medicinal and mystical constituents that really help with symptoms associated with PTSD in veterans, which has been my specific working group for the last eight years. And also uh, sexual abuse related trauma, as well as social anxiety and end of life terminal illness treatment and acceptance. So this substance has tremendous capacity to heal and address certain things that are in a blind spot in our community medically. And I do feel that indigenous knowledge is valid, unlike many medical claims that there is not enough valid research. This substance has been used for thousands of years with no direct deaths associated. And in fact, uh, I personally have had many friends use psilocybin medicinally to prevent suicidal ideation and also heal long-term chronic and medically prescribed depression. So I believe in this substance and I look forward to when Hawaii can legally administer this medicine and also help to reduce the rates of pharmaceutically assisted beings who are currently dealing with depression because that is something that's plaguing my generation. And I believe that psilocybin has a, has a cure, has major potential there. So I just wanna say um, thank you. And I do think that skilled professionals should be the ones administering this medicine. So there needs to be structure around how that needs, how that can be done. Uh, hopefully a tax-free structure with one at that. And uh, I also wanna say that this medicine in tr like traditional and indigenous ways has been used in a family oriented context. So mother and daughter together or father and nephew together healing trauma that they've been, to, been through, whether it's sexual abuse and molestation or physical abuse, things like that. It shows great potential with family therapy. So yeah, that's about all I have to say. And uh, next we have Raymond Kemp. In support? Yes, this is Raymond Kim. Um, good afternoon. Um, uh, as, as a father, uh, in support, right? As a father and friend of many who have suffered the ravages of depression, anxiety, grief, addiction, and other debilitating conditions I've witnessed these emotional states, trauma and frustration, fear and breakdowns of these loved and ravaged souls, attempting to navigate therapy and pharmaceutical efforts to find the right combination of medication just to maintain semblance of a normal life. Oftentimes, the efforts of balancing these people are futile. It's gut-wrenching and heartbreaking to be a person trying to provide support for those in need only to watch them struggle one step forward two steps back absolutely heartbreaking i'm asking you to pass sp 3160 and allow this treatment to be available and within affordable reach of our loved ones thank you very much uh, next we have amanda lillybridge 
Aloha. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak here today. My name is Amanda. I work on behalf of the Clarity Project, which is Hawaii's psilocybin advocacy organization. And I also work for a family owned medicinal mushroom company here in Hawaii called Malama Mushrooms. Um, so I, as you can see, I'm extremely passionate about the healing capabilities of fungi. Um, and outside of the undeniable science that has proven the efficacy of psilocybin as a healing modality, um, my anecdotal experience with it has been nothing short of profound. Um, the healing and hope that it offered me post-trauma um, with anxiety and depression has completely transformed my life for the better. And I believe that everyone deserves access to this medicine um, in what has continued to be a broken mental health system. So I urge you to move forward with this initiative and thank you for allowing me the chance to speak. Thank you very much. I also have registered to testify Sean Lester, Tia Amanda Carrasco, and Alamanda. Are any of those individuals on the call? No, Chair. Okay. Seeing none, I'd like to note the, uh, the written testimony of 78 individuals in support, eight in opposition, and two with comments. Members, we have about eight minutes left, so we're going to have to defer the um, taking of testimony for the final two measures. But were there any questions for any of the testifiers present on this measure? Okay. Chair. Sure. Uh, yes, Senator Favela. Yeah, so I guess can be any of those uh, <laughs> companies or people that are using the mushroom for therapy. I just got a question for them. It would be, I guess, Amanda or whoever was speaking about their um, using. Sure, the I'm maybe Okay, so the question is uh, for um, the mushrooms, can you just eat it like that or you gotta prepare it? It's best to measure the quantity and have that be related to the assisted psychotherapy. So sometimes facilitators administer micro dosing, which is like a smaller, less than a half gram dose for a longer period of time for chronic depression. If there is a guided session that's done with a uh, skilled professional or in the safety of someone's home, they can do a higher dose around 3.5 to 6 grams of dried mushroom powder. Uh, and that can facilitate more of a what you would call a mystical experience. And usually those are administered to people who are having end of life terminal illness treatment, stage four cancer diagnostic or people who are just returning from war. Those, those are, have been some studies around those people. And then in um, Oaxaca in Mexico, the Mazatepec of Oaxaca, the indigenous people who use it there, they do it with one large mushroom. So it's usually not weighed. It's a mushroom about the size of a thumb and they eat that with the guidance of a medicine woman or medicine man. And there is a certain singing and rhythms that go along with that to help the person have an emotional release which is usually in the form of tears or um, sometimes just like anger will come out where they have a, a release and uh, also have a physical healing along with that kind of psycho-spiritual somatic healing experience. So yes, you can just eat them, but it's best for the sake of therapy to have a appropriate reason and dose and also yeah, set in Okay, I, no, the only reason why I got a question with that is because um, I remember when we first was coming out with medical marijuana and medical marijuana has all the elements and stuff that you're talking about um, in helping with uh, depression, postmortem, um, a lot of the a lot of the stuff that you guys are talking about now, but it doesn't have as much as monitoring. So that's why I was wanting to, wanting to know, I mean, there's a big difference in the two on, on how it's administered and, and taken. So um, thank, thank you for clearing it up. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Stella. So we're not gonna be able to uh, vote on this agenda today. Uh, my recommendation is that we roll, uh, we defer decision-making on the measures that we heard uh, to Friday, February 11th at 1.30 p.m. We will also take testimony on the final two measures, SB 3356 and SB 760 at that hearing. We just ran out of time today because of all of the joint committee uh, hearings, but I do see two individuals on the call who would still like to testify. 
uh, we have four minutes left. There's two minutes each. So if you can uh, summarize quickly, then we have time to take you before we adjourn at 2.30. We'll start with Amanda, please go ahead. Hi, uh, I just wanna say um, coming with my experience from being a career caregiver for the elderly for 12 years, I was on several teams for people who are nearing end of life. And what I saw commonly in everybody was the fear of dying and the stress and worry in everybody's eyes. And even they would tell me, you know, things they were worried about. And thinking about my personal experience with psilocybin was it giving me an ex a tremendous amount of tranquility and peace and acceptance with the coming to terms with my own passing. So I would love to have people have access to a medicine that could provide a, a similar experience if possible. Um, I just think that that would be very um, humanitarian. You know, if somebody's facing death, I think they should have the opportunity to have access to something that could provide relief of any kind. Um, so that's that's kind of where I come from my standpoint. Uh, thank you very much. Ms. Shin, please proceed. Hi, committee members. Thank you so much for giving me the time. Just wanted to share that I'm the project manager for Clarity Project. We're one of the leading organizations talking about this issue. And I just wanted to share some super high level points. One is that psilocybin is completely natural. Um, and because of that, it actually makes it uh, much safer than the traditional pharmaceuticals that are being used to treat the very illnesses we're talking about. Um, you know, SSRIs, antidepressants, those have a ton of side effects. And so while it's not completely safe, it is a lot safer than a lot of those medicines. It's also not addictive. Um, it's less addictive and um, more, more safe than caffeine. And so this is something that's really important to emphasize. Um, we're also, you know, hearing amazing stories from our community, the science is coming out from around the world, institutions like Harvard um, and a lot of reputable institutions around the world have opened up psychedelic study centers um, in the universities. And, you know, something that we want to emphasize is that this bill is calling for a working group to be established for therapeutic access, and it allows the Department of Health to start that conversation to keep up with what the FDA and what's happening at a federal level. So we're just asking that that conversation be started so that we can prepare for therapeutic access um, when that time comes. And finally, we would be following in the footsteps of um, other states that are pursuing this from Oregon, Connecticut, California, and others. So thank you so much for the time. Okay, thank you very much to all the uh, individuals in, in, uh, on the call who we're not gonna have the time to um, allow to testify for the final two measures. Uh, I apologize. We can uh, reach out to you and have you re-registered to testify on Friday for the final two measures and for the rest of the measures on this agenda, uh, we can vote them out again Friday, February 11th at 1.30 p.m. Uh, members, uh, one quick note, we do have um, a joint with the Education Committee at 3.30, trying to get these uh, joint hearings all taken care of this week uh, before the lateral. So on that note, we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>